Have you ever had that feeling of insignificance? I mean, let's think about it. We've all been teens, haven't we? Except for those that are, are yet to get there. But just think about those days where there was that one special person upon whom your eyes were set and you really didn't know whether they even knew that you existed. This is the plot of probably 85% of the coming of age romantic comedy dramas that we see coming out of Hollywood because it touches such a nerve. But it's not just in our teen years that we go through that, is it? I mean, maybe in our workplace. We have a situation where we've done some really good work and yet we wonder whether the boss even knows who we actually are. Or maybe you're sort of looking out and seeing the change that needs to go on in the world. You see injustice, you see strife, you see things that should change and you think to yourself, what can one person do? That feeling of, of insignificance. I mean, have you ever thought that your entire existence really doesn't matter? Maybe you've even gone as far to wonder whether anyone would actually miss you if you happened to go. These are common challenges, common emotions that we have as humans. And the Psalms speak to this, as we will see this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And while you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit of background with this psalm. Psalm 8 is unique in the Psalter, in the book of Psalms, because Psalm 8 is the only psalm that we have that is wholly directed towards God. Now, that kind of seems strange, doesn't it, when you think about it? Yes, there are other psalms that have aspects of worship that are directed towards God, but only Psalm 8 is wholly directed towards God. You see, in some of the, most of the other psalms, we'll see praise directed to God for His goodness and His glory, but then the psalmist will move and will then exhort the people to praise God. And they'll frequently give reasons why we should be praising God and use that as the motivating factor to encourage the people of God to worship Him. But Psalm 8 opens and closes and throughout is directed specifically to God. So let us read Psalm 8. To the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, a psalm, of David. Yahweh our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under him his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Yahweh our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. This morning as we look at Psalm 8, as we study the psalm of praise, I want to show you God's glory as the Creator. But also, to answer that question this morning about our insignificance, those feelings that we have by looking at man's glory as the creature. So God's glory as Creator, 
and man's glory as creature. Starting out with God's glory as creator, it it permeates the opening of the psalm, doesn't it? Verses 1 and 2, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glories, your glory above the heavens. So it speaks of God as creator. And notice as I was reading it, it probably threw you maybe a little bit as you're reading your text, because in the New King James it says, O Lord, our Lord. But where we see that word Lord, sometimes we see God, but Lord typically in all capitals. If you look closely there, you'll see that the O, the R, the D aren't small letters, but are capital letters. What that tells us is in the Hebrew text underneath this, we have the name of God. And so this is the psalmist using God's name, speaking of Him, um, using that in praise of Him to speak of who He is. This is the name that is revealed to Moses in Exodus 3. When, When Moses asks, when he's been sent back to the people of Israel, what name should I give them? And our God responds, I am whom I am, Yahweh. And so we have here, again, a uniqueness. It's not often we see Yahweh being given the title Lord. It's fully appropriate. And that's why in our English Bibles we have the word Lord as convention, because the Jews stopped using the name of God because they thought it might break the second commandment. And so they'd substitute in the word Lord in that scenario when we do that in our English text. And that's what we also see, don't miss that in the New Testament. For example, as we read this morning, that Jesus is Lord. It's hearkening back frequently to this divine name. And He is that He is. He is the self-existent One, the God who always has been, and therefore He is the One who has created. He is the Creator. And the works of His hands, the works of His fingers as we see them described, they speak of who He is. They demonstrate to every single person His glory, His power, and His might. And so when we look at the creation, as the psalmist here most likely has done as he pens this, what else should flow from our lips and out of our hearts but praise to the magnificent One who created everything, who has set His glory in the heavens? The psalmist goes on and This is probably the trickiest part of this psalm. The words make sense, but the question is, what does the psalmist mean? How does the psalmist develop his praise through the use of of verse 2, where he writes, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, it's okay for us to struggle sometimes as we interpret, particularly out of the Psalms. We think back to your time at school, those of you who have done English at school, and having to go through and study poetry. I frequently couldn't make head nor tail of what the poet was trying to convey. And that's because the poetry requires the poet to use language and to, to stretch the use of language sometimes in order to make it rhyme, to fit a specific meter so that it has the same number of beats along each line. And what that does when you then take that from one language and bring it into another can make things difficult to understand. And that's okay. Because something like verse 2 isn't definitional of the faith that we hold. But as we kind of open it up, as we we scratch at its surface, we can get a reasonable idea of what it is that the psalmist is looking to say. And it helps us in this particular situation 
that we have a couple of wonderful interpreters to help us understand what the psalmist is meaning in this verse. Because you see, Jesus himself quotes this verse. Have a look at Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, this is just after Jesus has entered Jerusalem, that triumphal entry. And he's come in and the crowds have been singing Hosanna to the Son of David, praise to the Son of David. And then from verse 12, Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, speaking to the Pharisees. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And said to Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? See, Jesus goes back and quotes Psalm 8 to these religious leaders and says to them, why are you surprised that the children can recognize the things of God? See, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, praise comes forth to God. I mean, think about it, parents particularly, think of your children. If you've raised them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, it's more frequent. But even young children, the scientific studies have been done to demonstrate that young children innately understand there is a God. See, they're not blinded by worldliness to the same extent. They're not blinded by their sin. They're not, their hearts haven't been hardened through the constant rebellion against God to a full point. Are they perfect? No. But they recognise the majesty of of God. They recognize the glory of creation frequently far more clearly than many adults do. And so this is, I think, why the psalmist uses this phrasing in verse 2. He's speaking of this innate wonder, this innate knowledge that these young children can look out, can see the works of God, can see the hand of God in all that happens, and frequently, frequently children can ask those annoying questions that get to the root and the heart of an issue, that make it really difficult for somebody who is actively suppressing the truth of God to actually be able to answer them. And this is what we see Paul say in Romans chapter 1. Cast your mind back a few months to when we went through Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, Paul writes, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, this is the, the people, for God has shown it to them. How is God shown His glory and His power to the general population? Through His creation. I mean, we look out at the complexity of a tree. We look at the complexity of the human body or a portion of the human body, an eye, a hand. We think of our cardiovascular system, the heart, the veins, the arteries, the blood that pumps through it. Here we have a machine that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for 80, 90, 100 years without taking a break. We cannot design a machine that does that. When we look at creation, it shows us an element of what God is like. 
Paul goes on in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by the creatures. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. But out of the mouth of babes, praise is prepared for the true creator. So this is the, the, the wisdom of God bringing to nothing the so-called wisdom of man. You see, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is is a passage that should always humble us, is, is a passage that we should probably be reading at least on an annual basis to remind ourselves not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 through 29, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world, like children, to put to shame the wise, and has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, like the children. God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, for what reason? That no flesh should glory in His presence. So the reason that God prepares praise out of the mouth of babies, out of infants, out of young children, is to shame those of us who think that we are wise in our own eyes. To remind ourselves that we are fundamentally nothing, to tear down our self-esteem, our pride, and to demonstrate that He is far wiser, far stronger than we ever could be. That's the point of verse 2. It's what verse 2 is communicating to us, and that fits because as we look then into verse 3, the psalmist takes that and brings it to a natural conclusion. He says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, not even the work of his hands, but of his fingers, indicating that the glory that we see around us is absolute trifle to God and his creative power, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? I think of the vastness of the universe. But it's so vast, we don't know how far it is. We look out and we see the beautiful Milky Way galaxy. And yet every one of those pinpricks of light is a star far larger than the one that warms us that we call the sun. And there are millions and billions of those stars in that one galaxy, and then there are millions and billions of galaxies. You see, when we look out, we look up from ourselves, we should feel insignificant. Because on the level of creation, we are. We are insignificant in comparison to the Creator. 
But then the question flows out of that, if we can look out and we can see this great creation that's out there, and if that speaks of there being a God, is this just some impersonal force that just wound everything up and then sat back on his lazy boy to watch the top spin? Because that's what so much of religion today, or spirituality is the in term, isn't it? Is, is this concept of this impersonal God, this force that somehow came about and created everything and kind of, sort of has something to do with us, but really is too concerned with other things to worry about us on earth. This was the view in Roman times, in Greek times, of their gods. See, the problem was not so much of how do I get favour with God, but can I attract any attention from any of the gods because they're too busy fighting amongst themselves to care about what goes on here on earth. But the problem that we run into is that when the gods fight amongst themselves, they end up causing problems for us here on earth. They don't necessarily intend to, but they're off in their own world doing their own thing. And in that case, if that is the creation that we have, man is completely insignificant. And creation should put us into that place. Again, Romans 1 verse 20. And that leads in our modern culture today to a prevalence of what is called nihilism. Nihilism comes from a a Latin word, nihilo, which means nothing. See, and in this concept of nihilism, there is this belief that life is functionally meaningless. There is no purpose. There is no plan. Paul summed it up as he was speaking in 1 Corinthians 15 about the the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he says, "If, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's where the world is at. And what does that lead to? That leads to a lack of morals. Because if the whole thing is to eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die, if this life is meaningless and purposeless and has no point to it, then why do I need to conform to a set of morals? Why do I need to behave in a certain way? Why can't I just do what I feel like doing? And if we are insignificant, if there is no God, then it's a fair question. This is the question that the preacher in Ecclesiastes wrestled with. The book of Ecclesiastes wrestles with this idea all the way through. And so he opens the book, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labour in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south and then it turns and goes towards the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. The rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, they return again. All things are full of labour, man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. See, if we just look out into the creation and we see these cycles of things going on and on and on. It points to futility. This is why Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, 
what they're seeking to do is break out of this cycle of rebirth and reincarnation. They look at the water cycle, for example, and see that the rivers run to the sea, but the sea isn't full, that it all comes back again. Well, maybe that's what life is like for us. And so they seek to break out from this meaningless, endless cycle of nothingness. And in our modern culture, that leads to a culture of death, because if life is meaningless then what does it matter if we dismember a child in its mother's womb? Its life was meaningless anyway. And that's the thing, is if what the preacher says at the start of Ecclesiastes is all we have, if if all we have is looking out at our creation, then despair and hopelessness would be correct. What is man that you are mindful of him? But contained in that question is the seed of the answer. Because the lion isn't running around going, what is a lion that you are mindful of him? The whale is not swimming around going, what is a whale that you are mindful of him? The fly buzzing around in here is not going, what is a fly that you are mindful of him? The fact that we can think those thoughts tells us that that is not all there is. That the Creator is not some impersonal force, but is a person that can be known and should be known. And when we seek for that, we will find what we're looking for. And that's what the psalmist goes on as we look now at man's glory as creature. Man's glory as creature. Look here at verses 5 through 8. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. What is man that God is mindful of him? Man is the crowning glory of His creation. We are the crowning glory of God's creation. As wonderful as the galaxies are, and the planets and the worlds that exist that no eye has ever seen, and likely no eye will ever see, they are nothing in comparison to man. So look here, verse 5, for you have made him a little lower than the angels. Now, there's debate over how this should be translated. And if you look across some translations, most stick with angels and, and a large part of that is because when the Jews translated the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek, they used the term angel, messenger. However, the term in the Hebrew is God. That word can be used of angels, of messengers, of heavenly beings. But in this situation, I I side with the commentators who say that this should probably be translated, that you have made him a little lower than God. And why should it be translated to that? Well, how was man and woman created? We're created in the image of God, are we not? And so we've been created a little lower than God. We're not to the same extent. We are not God. We are not gods, despite what some heretics might try and teach. And Jesus speaks of this when the Pharisees try and stone Him for claiming to be the Son of God, and what's His response to them? Why are you stoning me for claiming to be the Son of God? Don't your Scriptures describe you as gods? Again, referencing the Psalms. 
We are created in the image of God, but a little lower. And we see that in the next verse, or the next half of the verse, because we have been crowned with glory and honour. I mean, think of, of that contrast. We're made a little bit lower, but yet we are given glory and honour. Why is that? Because we are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are the only thing made in the image of God. We are the only thing into which the breath of life was breathed by God. And as we will see, we are also the only thing to whom God came to redeem it directly. We're crowned with glory and honour. We have purpose, we have meaning. We are not insignificant to God. To answer that question, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you have visited him, is to look back to creation and to see that God created us with a specific purpose in mind. We are not a random accident that happens to have come about with a few fizzing chemicals bumping into each other. We are not highly evolved goo. We are specifically created to bear the image of God, of our Creator. And to take that image, and in that image of God, we were given a task. We, humankind, were given a task. We had a purpose established for us. It's given to us here in our verses. But let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Let's go back to the creation account and see the purpose for which God created man. Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30. Then God blessed them, that is, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice those three. Fish of the sea, birds of the air, every living thing. Don't we see those in Psalm 8? Those are the three things that Psalm 8 speaks of us having dominion over because that is a creation mandate. Verse 29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seeds, to you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. But the question that flows, what does it mean to take dominion? If we have been given dominion over this earth, if the command that Adam and Eve were given in the garden was to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and have dominion over, over it, what does it mean for us to have dominion over the earth? Dominion simply means control or authority over something. A dominion is something over which someone has control or authority. New Zealand used to be a dominion of the United Kingdom. New Zealand used to be a dominion of the United Kingdom. What that meant is that we were governed from London and we didn't have direct government of ourselves. That was changed. We now have direct government of ourselves. And at that point, we stopped being a dominion of the United Kingdom. And so to have dominion is to have control or authority over something. And to be more specific then, if we are the ones having dominion over the earth, we are to do so as stewards. See, we're not given a blank slate. 
We are not given a limitless bound into which we are to operate when it comes to having dominion. Why not? Because we were made a little lower than God. God made us a little lower than Him and then assigned us a task, a purpose, to go and have dominion over this realm to which He allocated us to have dominion. We do not have dominion over the spiritual realm. Again, despite what many heretics will preach today, we cannot go round and command demons and devils to flee. That's God's job. We can call and pray to God to do that, but we do not have authority over the spiritual realm. We do not have dominion over the spiritual realm. That is God's dominion. We have dominion over the earth. And we're to exercise that dominion as his image bearers, as those created slightly lower than him, on behalf of God. Which means we are to operate, to steward this planet in the same way that God would do it. This is the point of the parables of the stewards that Jesus tells. The unjust servant, the um, servants who are, who are sleeping and know at not which time the master will return. What's the whole understanding and concept inside that is that here are people who have been placed into a realm of authority to have stewardship over a domain. And they are to take the talents which with they, that they have been given and they are to use those talents for the glory of God in the same way that God would do so. And when we do that, when we have that stewardship mindset, when we take that dominion, we are glorifying God. Why are we glorifying God when we do it? Because we're doing what we've been created to do. It's as simple as that. When we walk in obedience to God, we bring glory to Him. When we walk in disobedience to God, we bring dishonour to ourselves. And so we are to therefore rule over creation. We are to to rule over this earth. We are not to have it rule over us. You see, this is the fundamental flaw of much of the environmental movement today. So the issue I have with the environmental movement is not that we should treat this planet well. It's not that we should be wise in the way that we use the resources that we have been given on this earth. The issue that I have is that ultimately... The environmental movement seeks to place the creation that we are meant to have dominion over to have dominion over us. And that is inverting the order of what it should be. We can use the resources that God has given us. That's what he said in Genesis chapter 1. That's what he says here in Psalm 8. That all things have been put under our feet. However, because of Adam's sin, because of our sin in Adam, we cannot and we will not take dominion in the way that we ought to. We as humans will abuse the earth. We will take things in a way that is not appropriate. We will do that because we are trying to usurp God ultimately. Rather than living in the parameters that God has established for us, we go and try and live according to our own thoughts, our own ideals, our own law. And when we do that, we suffer the consequences. And because of Adam's sin, our work on taking dominion is frustrated. Our work on taking dominion is frustrated. I mean, how many of you have been out into the garden this week? How many weeds did you have to pull out of the garden? See, weeds are these wonderful things. All you have to do is ignore a garden and suddenly they turn up. It's like mess in children's room. And dust. 
And all of these things, they just turn up if we don't do anything. Why is that? Because the world is cursed because of sin. The curse in Genesis 3. Through the sweat of your brow, Adam, thorns and thistles will come up to frustrate your work. And you will have to toil against the effects of sin in addition to toiling to bring dominion. And so because of that frustration, because in a sense the earth is no longer cooperating with us to help have this dominion brought about, we are going to have frustration and challenge as we seek to exercise the dominion that we are called to have. But, there's always a but, and when it comes to the gospel, it's always a good one. But, Jesus. See, taking dominion will be completed successfully and properly at the end. The Edenic paradise, what we see in that walking with God in the cool of the evening that Adam and Eve had prior to the fall in Genesis will be restored to us at the end of time. As will our ability to take dominion, to go forth and, and subdue the earth. That will all come and it will come because of the work that Jesus has done. And this is why Paul, in, Hebrew, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, the writer to the Hebrews in, in Hebrews chapter 2, take this psalm, and particularly those verses in the middle, 5 and 6, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and the angels, and crowned him with glory and honour. Paul takes that in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, sorry, in the writer to Hebrews, probably Paul, takes that and applies it in Hebrews chapter 2 to Jesus. You see, Jesus was, was made a little lower than the angels for a time. Here he is, God himself, clothing himself in human form. Stepping into his creation to answer the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that God is mindful of him? So valuable that God himself took on the form of man to come and rescue and save us from our sin. That is who we are. And in the promise in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that the promise here is that all things will be put into subjection to Christ, but as yet today we do not see all things in subjection to Christ. And we see that in the world, don't we? We see the sin, We see the rebellion, we see the lawlessness still continuing in this world today, but there will be a time when every enemy will be placed under the feet of Jesus and the last enemy to be placed under his feet will be death. See, Jesus, the true Adam, the true man, is the true fulfillment of the promise here. He answers the question, what is man that you are mindful of him. And so as we think to that, those thoughts of insignificance that we've had in our lives, as we think to those times where we wonder, why God, why me? Why do you pay any attention to me? The answer comes in Jesus. We are so valuable to him not of anything of us, but because He's chosen to save us, He's chosen to redeem us. That is why we are so valuable to Him. That is why He is mindful of us. That is why He visits us. That's why He has given us His Word, so that we might know Him and honour Him and praise Him, which is what the psalmist then concludes the psalm with, isn't it? He goes right the way back, to his opening lines. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So let us come before him in praise as we close. Yahweh, our Lord, 
How majestic is your name in all the earth? As we look to creation, as we look to the wonder and the splendor that you made, we, with the psalmist, ask that question, who are we that you are mindful of us? But we thank you that you did not leave us in the dark on that question. You did not leave us to grope around and try and find you to work out who you are and what you would have for us, but that you spoke through your prophets, your apostles. You gave us your word, the scripture, our Bibles, that we might know you, know who you are and know what you expect of us. And then as you spoke to us and gave us your law and your commands, We're sorry that we destroyed them, that we rebelled against you, that we sought for our own good and our own glory and not your good and not your glory. Yours is the name that is to be praised and gloried above all other names and we are so sorry for the times that we have dragged that through the mud. But we are so thankful, our Lord Jesus, that you willingly clothed yourself in humanity You stepped into your creation, descending from your glorious throne, coming to live the life that we ought to have lived and to die the death that we deserve to die so that we might be forgiven of our transgressions. We might be forgiven of our trespasses and of our sins. And we thank you that in doing so, Lord Jesus, you answered that question, who are we? that you are mindful of us. So let us go forth this morning in praise. Let us constantly have praise for the name of Yahweh on our lips. Let us go forth to the people around us declaring your great works, your mighty deeds, and most importantly, that free offer of salvation that you proclaim and call everybody to partake of. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you this morning. Amen.